uh, I just want to ask you if if any of you are sitting in seats where I can't see you, uh, please move into where uh, the camera can pick you up so that we can have an interaction. Everybody's cool. All right, beautiful. Let's do this thing. Well, well, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the trouble to come in here. I know some of you drove quite a distance, and uh, and I know when you signed up for our, uh, for an online class that it's kind of an imposition to have you come into campus. Uh, but you know, uh, it's the only way we have to give you these wines for free, and. Uh, and it, it really is an essential part of the course. Um, you know, more and more we think that we can get information on the internet, but you know what? You just can't uh, just read about wine. You have to really have the experience of putting it in your mouth. And so I'm gonna try to condense something like 90% of what you need to know into these two hours. Uh, and then you'll be done and, uh, and we can go back online. Uh, I have to say this is a wonderful class. You guys have been really uh, on top of the work and I uh, encourage you to keep doing that. Uh, it's, there's a lot of information in this class and you, you really don't want to fall behind. And most of you are doing a great job with that. So that's pretty cool. All right, here's how it's gonna go. We're gonna talk about Name That Aroma and uh, just sort of sensory, you know, how your brain works. Uh, 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 cognitive uh, cognitive uh, 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 processing of uh, wine flavors and aromas. And then I'm gonna talk about, uh, put you in the know about glassware. There's quite a bit of uh, different kinds of glassware that we use. And then, uh, uh, and then, and then we'll we're going to talk about uh, well, uh, yeah. There, uh, then we're going to talk about corkscrews and how those go, and uh, and then and then we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about uh, we're gonna go through these 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 uh, sixteen wines that we've got. And, and th that'll give you an introduction to something like 90% of the, of the major uh, brands and, uh, and, you know, the, t the, wine, the major wine types so that you'll be able to kind of, uh, uh, kind of hold your own uh, in, in any setting. So that's two hours. Uh, so let's start with, you know, for some reason y'all's uh, video stopped working. I, I don't, I don't see you. I see, I see Carlotta Smith. Uh, maybe, I'm not quite sure how I get you where I can see you. Uh, hmm. That work? No. Yeah, I don't know how that's happening. Uh, there you are. Oh, you see us now? Yeah, how did that happen? Great question. <laughs> okay, well, so, so here is where I really want to interact with you. You, Everybody did the, the, the coffee cup name that aroma exercise? The purpose of that exercise was to put you in a place where you smell something that you know is familiar, but you have trouble naming it. Did any of you have that experience where you kind of knew, yeah, I, 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 I smelled that before, but you just had the trouble putting a name to it? Yeah, just raise your hand if that, if that occurred for you. Good, good, good. Okay, so let me explain why that is. 
the human jaw got weaker about 1.8 million years ago. We can see it in the fossil record. However, a recent book called uh, Sapiens by uh, an Israeli anthropologist named uh, uh, Noah Harari uh, demonstrated that human conceptual cognition, uh, in other words, what, you, what, what you're doing in your conscious identity all the time, uh, is, is uh, working with abstract concepts, concepts like, like money and religion and, you know, courage and, uh, uh, you know, authority, nations. These are all fictions, you know, that you can't, you can't point to them, uh, but they're, they're, they're conceptual. So, um, so that means when the human jaw got weaker, that, that's how we know that we were, con we were controlling fire and that we were social and that we were using tools almost two million years ago. And yet this conscious identity only came into being about 70,000 years ago. So, you know, we got the better part of two million years when we had uh, senses, but we didn't have language. Uh, so that means a million years ago, one of your ancestors was wandering through the woods and saw these uh, berries. And then the thing was, are these berries going to be good to eat or are they going to be poisonous? So we developed a lot of senses. Uh, you know, for example, we're very, very sensitive to the smell of mold and the smell of vinegar. Uh, and we're also very sensitive to bitterness because that would tell us that there were alkaloids in those berries or that they were spoiled. Uh, and so then we wouldn't eat them. We'd, or if we had put them in our mouth, we'd spit them right out. Uh, and that's what kept us alive for 2 million years. Uh, and then of course, if they tasted good, and they were sweet and fruity and, you know, positive, then uh, the, the signal would get sent to the pleasure centers of the brain and encourage us to, to continue to eat those berries because, you know, we were hungry. So, so that's why uh, the sense of smell was much more important back then than it is now. And we spent a couple of a million years uh, doing that without having a language for what those things are. And that, showed up in a completely different part of the brain. So right now, when you smell things, the recognition mechanisms are, are very uh, strongly linked to memory directly, not through language. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because this is what's going to happen in the next two hours. And every time you put your nose in a, in a glass of wine, much any aroma that you can think of will show up <clears throat> in a wine somewhere. And you'll just often have the, have the sensation to go, oh man, that smells so familiar. I wonder what the heck it is. So, uh, so professional masters of wine and sommeliers and wine judges, uh, they don't they don't have any better of a, a, a sensory apparatus than you do, but what they do have for every wine type is a kind of a laundry list of six to 12 things that they're automatically looking for when they go in and taste a, let's say a Riesling or a Cabernet Sauvignon or whatever it is, whatever the wine type is, they've already determined what's likely to be there. And so it makes it really easy for them to, to judge that particular type of wine because they know what it's supposed to taste like. Uh, and that's the dirty little secret of wine judging. So uh, what I want you to do today and as you go along is to start making your own little checklist 
uh, what you might be looking for in each of these different wine types. Okay? And I'm going to make some suggestions and uh, about what I see in these in these wines, and you may or may not agree with me. Uh, so that doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong. It, it just means that I have my own checklist, and uh, yours might be the same or it might be different. But that's the, that's the key to really appreciating wine is for each one, knowing what you're looking for. Okay, now another thing that I want you to understand, uh, all 16 of these wines are here because there's a large segment of the population that loves that particular kind of wine. I'm willing to bet that none of you will love all these wines. The difference between a consumer and a wine professional is that you have to be able to recommend wines that you don't personally like. So, uh, about, you know, in, in your uh, uh, module one, when you were, or I guess it's module two, when you were talking about your first wine experience and talking about what kind of wines you like, about half of you said that you really pretty much just like sweet wine. And the other half said that you really pretty much hate sweet wine. And what you're into is these uh, red wines, the dry red wine. So some of you may find those wines very bitter. Uh, and, you know, the, those of you who, who love the dry reds, uh, find the sugar in some of the sweet wines uh, uh, kind of obnoxious. So as a wine professional, you have to be able to embrace all of these styles and to be able to size up a person, you know, through dialogue about what kind of wine that they might like, and then you can make your recommendation. Okay. You know, let's not have this whole exercise be about what you like and what you don't like, but more like, what is that wine like and who would I recommend it to? What sort of person would go for that particular kind of wine, even if I'm not that person? Okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's, uh, that's sensory perception there. Now I want to talk about different kinds of wine glasses. Now, the, the glass that you've got is this one, which is an INOA glass. Uh, that, uh, and that INOA is a, a international uh, standards, a wine standards outfit that operates out of Europe. And they think this is a good shape uh, for uh, just general purpose wine tasting. Uh, when we go to judging, some people feel that this glass is a little too small. It's, it's eight ounces. And of course, you'd only fill it about half full, three or four ounces, uh, because it's designed, the reason it's pinched in the, in the top is to focus the aroma and make it more concentrated. Uh, and we'll take a glass like this to get more aroma and we'll swirl it. Now I'm going to show you a little trick uh, later on about how to how to get that swirling to happen without uh, spilling the wine on your you know, on your shirt. Uh, but uh, but that's the idea is to coat the uh, coat the glass with with wine so that we get more more uh, aromatics out of it. So. Uh, this is another INOA glass that we use in a lot of judgings. It's the same shape. It's just a little bigger. This is eight ounces and this is 11 ounces. Uh, and if you were just going to get some glass, some good wine glasses to go with, these are, these are fine for kind of all purpose. Uh, you may notice that they have a, a lip, a kind of a ring on the uh, at the top of the glass and that's how you know that this is a molded glass uh, it's made in a mold and they're they're heavy and kind of sturdy 
And so you can you know, bang them on the table here and they won't break. Uh, but they're not very elegant. So by comparison, this is a glass I use in my tasting room. Uh, and it's uh, got a longer stem and it has a tulip shape to it. Uh, and you see there's not that lip. Uh, so this is a hand-blown crystal and it's very delicate and I'm not going to bang this on the table because it will break. So it's fragile. But uh, this is considered a classier glass. And so if you had a, if you were working in a nice restaurant, you're better off with a glass like this. And then if you sell somebody a $200 bottle of wine, this glass is not the one you're gonna to wanna to put it in. You're gonna to wanna to put it in one of these. Now this is a tulip also, or it's also called a claret glass, which means that it's designed for Bordeaux. It's designed for Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and wines like that, Malbec. The difference is that uh, this, this, this is a 15 ounce glass. <laughs> this is a 46 ounce glass. And um, these go for about three bucks. These go for anywhere from 10 bucks to the really fancy Riedel uh, glasses that'll be uh, maybe a hundred dollars. Uh, this glass, this tulip shape is adapted for claret because claret has fairly strong aromas and it doesn't need too much uh, help from the glass to get your, uh, get your aroma. When we get to Pinot Noir, um, it's not that way. It's much more delicate. We'll be tasting a Pinot here in a minute. Uh, well, in an hour. Uh, and so instead of the claret shape here, uh, you would use a burgundy balloon. So this one has a much, much larger surface area in the bottom. You just put a little bit of wine in here and then you swirl it around and it coats the entire balloon and then it's pinched a little at the top so that you can get some aroma out of that uh, lighter wine. Now, uh, I met a guy, he was sitting right where you're sitting about 15 years ago. His name is Mike Falk, and he came to California, and he uh, became my assistant winemaker for a few years, and uh, started his own brand called Ingracia, which was his Cuban grandmother's name, and uh, his, his, his label looks like that. So you can see Ingracia was his, his grandmother. She was like the last person out of Havana in 1959. And you can see there's a little map of Cuba on this glass. But look at the shape. Uh, it's got a big bowl and then it's pinched more than the, than the burgundy balloon. So this is a really good glass, a modern design. It's only been out for a few years. Uh, but this thing really concentrates the aroma and you'll get you'll get double the intensity of aroma as you would with a glass like this and probably four times what you'd get in a glass like this. So glassware makes a big difference. Uh, sometimes we're we're really looking for elegance. Uh, this is my wife's favorite glass. She really likes Riesling and uh, she likes this, this cute little, it's like a little, honey, I shrunk the burgundy balloon. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just for uh, lighter wines. Uh, this one is designed for German Riesling. Uh, and it's just kind of cute. All right, now I want to talk about sparkling wine. So this, is a champagne coupe. Uh, and you'll see a lot of them when people cater uh, uh, and, they, and they bring out champagne, you get this, this flat bowl with a short, uh, maybe a half an inch of wine in it. And uh, these are terrible. 
you, you don't want to own these. You don't want to use them. They're the worst thing you can put champagne in because there's no way to watch the bubbles rise. And it also dissipates all of the, uh, all the carbonation very quickly. And there's no, uh, uh, you, you, you know, the, 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 the aroma is just kind of splattered all over the place. And, and so you can't smell the wine very well. Uh, the only reason this glass exists was because of propaganda in the French Revolution. So uh, you guys know who uh, Marie Antoinette was? Yeah. Yeah. So she was uh, Louis XVI's concubine, uh, 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 you know, live-in girlfriend. And she also was uh, uh, a big presence at the court. And so when they decide when the when the uh, the revolution happened uh, and the people rose up, uh, when they dragged Louis the Sixteenth out to the courtyard to cut off his head with a guillotine, they did the same thing to Marie Antoinette. So she was uh, not um, uh, politically well liked. Uh, so uh, one of the a glass blower just after that happened invented this glass now if you look at the portraits of Marie Antoinette you can see that she was kind of well known for having extremely well endowed breasts you know for, but but this was uh, like the original fake news so the guy the guy claimed that that he used Marie Antoinette's breast as the model for this glass. And he was kind of trying to say that she didn't have much go in there. Uh, this is like the original fake news. And that's where the, the shape of this glass came from. Uh, anyway, enough said about that glass. I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's a terrible glass and you should never use it. Okay, now uh, I want to show you uh, some better glasses. This is the one that you'll see around. It's called a flute, and it's just the opposite. It has quite a bit of, of uh, rise for the bubble, and it's pinched together, and uh, this is a very common uh, champagne glass. Uh, and the only problem with it is it actually only holds about four ounces of wine, which means that you have to keep coming back to the bar to get more more wine and so there are some sparkling wine uh alternatives uh i i don't have a tulip here but it's basically the same shape as the tulip here except that it has a hollow stem and that tulip will hold uh a, a lot more wine like seven ounces uh another alternative is the champagne trumpet that's shaped like this. It's it's hollow stem all the way to the bottom, and so you get here you get about nine or ten inches of rise to look at the bubble, and you you'll see how important that is when we get into these <laughs> other sparkling wines. Uh, then uh, this one, this is a modern champagne glass that holds a half a bottle, and so that ought to get you get you through a conversation without having to go back to the bar. Uh, I'm gonna open up a bottle of sparkling wine here to show you how to do it. Before I do, I'll just conclude. Uh, there are some of the wines we're gonna taste today, uh, the dessert wines, the port and the sherry, that are so uh, aromatic that they really don't need any help. Uh, and they're high alcohol, so we don't want the alcohol to blow us away. And so we'll use a little tiny glass like this, and we'll just put maybe an ounce of wine in the bottom there. And that's, that's all the glass you need to, uh, to give you, uh, you know, a good appreciation of those more strongly powerful wines. Uh, so this is a brandy snifter, and it's designed so you can put your hand in here and warm the brandy uh, so that you coax the aroma out. 
We don't want to do that with wine. We want it to stay at the same temperature, and we also don't want to smell whatever might be on our hand. Uh, you know, whether whether our hands are dirty or maybe we've got some lotion on them or something like that. And so, so all of these wine glasses are designed with a stem. You don't want to hold the wine this way. You want to hold it down here by the base. Uh, and that's, so that's the difference between the way you drink brandy and the way you drink wine here. All right, let's, I'm gonna open up some bubbly here. Uh, this, this isn't the, uh, the wines that we're gonna be tasting because I already opened those bottles up yesterday. And so I've got, I've got this, uh, this gizmo on the, uh, and you, you really ought to get one of these. So when you open up a bottle of champagne, you can put this stopper back on it and it will, uh, contain the wine and hold the bubbles and everything in case you don't want to drink the whole bottle at one sitting. So I'm, I, I opened those bottles yesterday. I'm going to open up a bottle of my own sparkling wine here. This is a, a, a sparkling Grenache from the Santa Cruz Mountains that's made in the Champagne style. So what do I mean by Champagne style? Well, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, and this was something that was invented by Dom Perignon. Uh, he was a monk about 400 years ago, and he wanted to have uh, bubbly wine. And so what they did, they, they ferment the wine dry, and then they put some more sugar in it, and they bottle it up uh, with a crown cap. And then they, so it re-ferments in the bottle, and, uh, and you get all of this pressure. And then they'll just lay it down on its side for one to four years, sometimes even longer. And the yeast will precipitate out and, and lie as a sediment on the side of the bottle. So then when they're ready to, to uh, what's called disgorge, uh, they're going to they're gonna start moving the, the bottle from this position up to about this position and they'll be twisting it and tapping it and twist and tap that's called riddling until they get all the yeast down here into the neck and then they put it in some brine uh, real cold and freeze the wine a plug of wine with all the yeast in it then they take a church key and blow that cap off of there and it'll and it'll push all that plug of ice uh, out and then they'll put some sugar in to top it up because champagne is very, very sour. It's, it's, it's loaded with acid and they need sugar to balance that. And in fact, back in the time of Louis XIV, when champagne first became popular, it was because it was the only sweet table wine that you could make. Uh, when we get into some of these Rieslings and White Zinfandels that are sweet, those are really recent. For the first 8,000 years, it wasn't possible to make sweet wine because it would just blow up. So these guys, uh, Dom Perignon figured out that if he put sugar in a bottle of champagne and corked it back up, that it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't re-ferment because the pressure of the CO2 keeps the sugar from, from fermenting again. And, uh, and so that it, the sec, that's the French word for dry champagne was actually 6% sugar, which is a whole lot of sugar. And then uh, the demi sec was 9% and the do, the sweet was 12%. So all champagne was exceedingly sweet. Uh, and then the British came along uh, and they said, well, you know, we'd like, we'd like uh, less sugar, if you don't mind. And the French said, well, but it would taste terrible. Only a beast would eat, would drink such wine. Uh, and so we will, we, will make, we will take your English money, but we will call it brute. So brute is actually originally an insult to the British that they would drink these terrible dry wines. 
Well, after World War II, everybody was making sweet wine because we figured out that we could put plastic sheets into atomic, uh, atomic piles, nuclear reactors, and the alpha particles would punch holes in the plastic, and then we could put the sheet in fluoric acid and get the holes to get bigger, uh, and they would all be the same size. And that would allow us to filter out the yeast and also with uh, gas to integrity test that uh, bubble pointable sterile filter. And that changed everything so that uh, this uh, Peters' shell <laughs> took a Riesling and called it Blue Nun. And that wine changed the world so that almost all of the white wine that we drink today is a is, is fresh and a little sweet, maybe. Uh, and even the dry ones are very fresh and clean, stainless steel, inert gas, all the things you learned about in uh, wine technology, those are all brand new. Uh, you know, we didn't even have electricity until about 100 years ago in wineries. So uh, the things you see in a winery today are very, very different than what you would have seen 150 years ago. Uh, but anyway, uh, in California, this is a brute zero. Even in France, even the brute has about one and a half percent residual sugar. But in California, we can make sparkling wines that don't have any sugar at all because our acids are not as high and we have a little more flavor in the fruit. It's not bland. Uh, so we have a lot of fun making this from Grenache grapes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna peel off this uh, top, just the top. See how I'm leaving the skirt in place? Uh, as we go along, I always want you to leave that package. So, uh, you know, this gold color is kind of designed to go with this gold foil down here. And so uh, always leave that skirt in place, not just for sparkling wine, but for, for any wine. Now, here, here's another example. This is a, an Italian Pinot Grigio Bartonura. And I've just cut off the lip here and I've left the whole skirt in place because it, it, it corresponds to the green down here at the bottom and, and this green. And so that's the whole package. When you serve wine, just cut the top off. And I'll show you a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, and preserve the skirt. So I've done that. Here I am. Now I've got this cork, this sort of mushroom-shaped cork, and it's wired onto the, onto the bottle. So you can see there's a, there's a ring there. And that's like a twist -em. I pull it down like so, and I'm gonna start untwisting it. But before I do, I gotta put my finger on the top of the bottle. The, the name of the game here is we wanna get that wine into the glass without putting somebody's eye out. So I'll just take this flute here. You always wanna have a glass ready at the handy when you, when you take this, uh, Take this cork out and then it's a good idea to have a napkin to help you twist it off. <clears throat> so here I go. Uh, I've got, I'm going to untwist this wire. Okay, there it is, you see, and now I can carefully lift off this wire hood. always kind of keeping a finger on the top. Okay. So now I'm going to pretend that this is screwed in with threads. I take my napkin so I can get some good purchase. And I've got my glass right there. And now the trick, 
you just unscrew it so that the cork comes in your hand and then you're ready in case the wine is going to gush a little bit that you got that glass right there. There we go. And then never pour directly into the glass standing up. You always want to pour down the side so that you minimize the loss of bubbles. You're still going to get some, but here you see I'm, I'm able to do this without creating a whole lot of foam. And then unlike uh, other glassware, it's okay to, to fill it pretty close to the, to the top. Um, and then you'll notice that the bubbles are quite fine. That's, that's what you get with a, a Method Champenois sparkling wine, as I described. Uh, and it looks very different than if you do bulk process, such as the, uh, the uh, Spumante, the musk, sparkling muscat that we're going to taste later on. Okay? All right. Now, before we uh, get into the wines, I want to talk about different kinds of Corkscrews. How are we going to get into the, the to these bottles? So, so this is the basic corkscrew right here. It's got a sleeve, and then there's a screw. It's a helix, and it's it's hollow in the center. Can you see that? So, uh, so the real pulling happens on the top edge of that helix. And uh, this is the simplest corkscrew you'll ever see. Uh, the sleeve fits in to make a kind of a T so that we have something to yank on. Uh, and we'll just uh, take a bottle here and open it that way. So I'm inserting into the top of the cork. I'm sure you've done this before. Uh, and then we screw it in. So now my problem is I'm going to have to stand up here and I'm going to have to take this bottle and, and really yank on it. And I'm, here I'm putting it between my legs here to hold on to it. Ew, where's that thing? It's really in there. So, so that's, that's the problem with this type of corkscrew is you don't have any mechanical advantage. And so you have to, you have to pull it like crazy to get it out. You can do it, but it takes a lot of strength and you sort of look ridiculous when you're doing it. So, uh, so we have a better idea, which is to have uh, a little leverage. And so here comes the, uh, the standard levered corkscrew. Now it's got a little knife on the end here and that's for cutting off the foil. So I can take this, I want to I want to cut it right there on the chime. And I can just cut like so. But I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I don't I don't like this type of corkscrew because uh, because the TSA keeps taking them away from me every time I go take an airline flight. Uh, and so I use this thing which is a lot easier. I just, I just put it right on there in the bottle and uh, just squeeze and twist the bottle. And there, there, the top of the capsule comes right off, leaving the skirt in place, it's much nicer. Uh, and so uh, this is what I use 
uh, this is what I have in my in my uh, bag when I get on the airplane is is a similar kind of deal where you have <coughs> these four wheels and this is uh, TSA approved they'll they'll let you onto the plane with one of these uh, I'm, I really think if I put my mind to it I could probably hijack a plane with this but yeah. so uh, anyway uh, so this has got a mechanical advantage here I'm gonna use this other one uh, and it's got also over here something that can open beer bottles all right so now same deal I'm going in here with the screw But what's different this time is I can I can get onto the uh, I got a lever working for me so I can pull that thing out, and the only problem is I can only get that far, so that's the extent of the lever, and now I got to yank the cork out the rest of the way. So, uh, so this is not perfect. So what we do instead. Now we're getting to the typical uh, waiter's corkscrew that looks like this. And it's the difference is it's got uh, a, a double action lever here. So now let's open up something with this and you'll see how much how much easier it works. So we, we go in, and this one has a nice Teflon coated uh, screw, so it goes in real easy. And now I take this first point of purchase, and I get the cork halfway up, like that. And then I can go like so and come down to this second point of purchase and get the cork all the way out. So you don't have to be very strong to use one of these and they're nice and compact. So that's known in the trade as a waiter's key. And uh, that's what you're gonna see in most people's uh, pockets. Uh, you know, you've got this beast, which has a Teflon screw there. This is called a screw pull. And it works really great. It's got a mechanical advantage. It'll even, uh, it, it'll even discharge the cork. But the problem is that it's just so big and cumbersome that nobody is going to use one of these uh, in a restaurant. <laughs> They're fine for home use. Uh, what you see around uh, around the house also is this guy here. I'm I'm gonna it has it has a couple of wings. I'm I'm gonna talk about that more in a second, but I want to show you a couple other things first. So there is another kind of cork opener that does not have a screw. Uh, it was invented in Japan, and it's called an ASO, A-H hyphen S-O. And I really like this guy. Uh, it's got these two prongs, one a little bit longer than the other, and the whole idea is to go on the outside of the cork. So I'll show you how that works. I'm going to insert one of the prongs on one side of the cork. Just put it in there a little bit. And then I'm going to bend this thing so that the other prong can fit in there. See, like so. And now I rock back and forth. Now you have to be careful never to push down on both prongs at the same time because if you do, the cork's going to go into the bottle. And then you'll have to fish it out. So, so I'm just rocking one at a time until I get all the way down 
like that. Now I've got a handle I can swing the bottle around and everything. But to get it out, I'm, uh, it's a little like the champagne where I'm going to pretend that the thing is screwed in with threads and I'm just going to pull and pull and twist at the same time. And I got that cork out and it's still intact. It doesn't have a hole in it. So what I can then do, let's say I, let's say I want to drink half of this bottle and then I want to take the rest of it home in my car. Well, I can take that cork and just reverse what I just did, put the prongs in there. And now I'm going to screw it back in like so. And now I just walk the prongs back out by rocking back and forth and I've resealed the container. So that's, that's something you can show the cops, you know, saying, well, you got that half empty bottle. Yeah, but it's a, it's a sealed container. Uh, that'll keep you out of jail. So I, I really, uh, really like the ASO. Uh, and then here's something else that I really like. Uh, oh, where is my crucible? Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is my Napa Cabernet winesmith. It's called Crucible. This is 2007. And I get $275 a bottle for it. Uh, however, if any of you come and visit me, I want you to taste this wine, but I don't want to open the bottle. I just want to give you a taste, right? So I've got this thing called a Coravan that's uh, an argon tapping system for expensive wine. And here's what I can do. Uh, I just clamp it on to the bottle. And there's a needle here that I just push into the, all the way into the bottle. And now I can take, you know, I'm gonna use a nice glass like the, this big claret glass here. And I can, use, I can push a little argon into the bottle and get you a sample. There you go. So there's, there's one ounce of a $275 bottle of wine. And uh, unfortunately, you haven't shown up here this morning. And so I'm just going to have to uh, drink this myself or give it to my wife, I guess. Uh, but, you know, come on by. And uh, if you're uh, working in an expensive restaurant with some pricey, you know, Opus One or <coughs> Chateau Lafitte on the list. You can sell wines by the glass that way with a Coravan without, uh, you know, just one glass at a time. And that, that wine can, uh, 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 can, it will preserve itself for, for months after it's been tapped into. Okay, so now we're getting ready to be able to start drinking some wine here. Uh, is, is, has Natasha made it back yet? Yeah, I came back a while ago. Good for you, how'd you do? I did great. We found a, hold on. Um, we found a Chateau Lafitte. It is German, it's Dr. Heidemann's Bergweiler Riesling. Excellent, Yeah. nice job. Okay, cool. Uh, would you please start uh, pouring the first flight? Of course. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have uh, four different kinds of white wine, and then a couple of rosés, different styles, and a couple of sparkling wines. 
and then we'll do five reds, and uh, and and then we'll do three dessert wines. So that's sixteen wines that will pretty much define, uh, uh, you know, ninety percent of what you need to know. Uh, and then the other ten percent, you know, I'm still working on that. <laughs> I, I, I want to mention that uh, there are really two wine industries. Uh, we'll go into this quite a bit uh, in modules, uh, I think, 10 and 11. Uh, so there's the wine that you see in stores. Is, uh, that's national distribution through the three-tier system. And all those wineries are like a half a million cases or more. Uh, there's 64 such wineries in the United States, and they completely dominate national distribution in the wine. You see in stores, it's, it's, it's analogous to the AM dial. So you got Britney Spears and Shania Twain and about a thousand other bands that completely dominate the AM dial music scene. Uh, but that's not really what's happening. What's really happening musically in the United States is there's about 2 million church choirs and barbershop quartets and garage bands out there, and each one of them has their own unique sound. And so that's the other wine industry. We have 64 wineries that are on the shelves, and then we have about 25,000 wineries that are averaging 2,000 cases instead of half a million cases, and that's where all the really goofy, interesting wine is. So that's the other 10%. Uh, by label, it's actually well over 99%, but you're not going to see those wines in stores and restaurants. You have to go there and, uh, and uh, you know, meet the winemaker uh, and her husband. Uh, uh, and uh, I think there's a big opportunity there for you to, if you pursue a career in hospitality and you end up running Hyatt in the Finger Lakes, you can become the local expert on all these little wineries in the Finger Lakes. But it's not just the Finger Lakes. It might be <laughs> Texas High Plains. It might be Iowa. It might be Colorado. Uh, there's an average of 100 mom and pop wineries in every US state now. And so you could become the local expert, not just about the wines, but about the people and the events that happen there, you know, there's a lot of music festivals, and you know, many of these wineries have a really cute dog, and uh, it's just a much more personal experience uh, where you can actually talk to the winemaker and the, and the people that work there. So <clears throat> I'm a big fan of those those little tiny wineries. Uh, all right, so I was talking about this corkscrew. Chances are that your mother has one of these. Uh, but there's another. Uh, now, can you guys see my uh, see my screen here? Did Did you see where a a corkscrew just appeared on my screen? Yay, all right, I figured out how to share my screen. <laughs> okay, so you got this kind of corkscrew, which has a helix there, and that's, 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 a, that's a good corkscrew. Uh, but the one you're looking at here is not the same kind. If you look carefully, there's no helix there. The helix is not, is not hollow. What that is, is a drill bit. And so this thing does not work very well to pull corks. What it does is it drills a hole in the cork and then extracts a big hole, leaving the cork behind. So uh, if that's what your mother has, you need to throw it away and, and, uh, and, and get one of these. <laughs> okay, you see the difference? I don't know what idiot ever invented that thing. 
All right. Now we're going to we're going to taste these four wines. And uh, you know, you got some some tips here for how you're going to make your wine review. This is the way you want to organize it. Uh, so the first wine is an Italian Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio is kind of interesting. It's actually uh, a mutation of a red wine, Pinot Noir, uh, and it gives, it has a little bit of color on the, uh, on the vine. So this isn't, technically, it isn't actually a white wine. It's a, it's a rosé. Uh, and if you look at the color, you can see that there's a little bit of a green or gray color to it. You compare it with the Sauvignon Blanc wine two. Wine two has a yellow green, uh, or we call it straw green color to it. Uh, so that's what white wines look like. This Pinot Gris has a slight gray or, or pinkish cast to it. Uh, it also has a little tiny bit of tannin. Uh, so those are, are typical. But when it, so when, when it comes to color, I'm going to say pale straw gray. As opposed to, uh, to the Sauvignon Blanc, which is straw green. Uh, do any of you know my buddy... Uh, 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 Roy G. Biv. That's right. It's the rainbow colors. Yeah. So, so these are the wavelengths of visible light uh, going from uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. That's, that's what Roy G. Biv stands for. And in the beginning, uh, the average of all of those put together is uh, this yellow green, straw green uh, color. As the wine oxidizes, it starts to move in the direction of uh, like yellow, ye yellow orange or kind of a golden color. And you can see that in the third wine that it's not as green it's a little bit more like gold still a good color and that's because chardonnay is aged in a barrel and it brings a little oxygen in uh, and so it's not quite as fresh and they do that to make uh, a richer richer flavor at the expense of this uh, of this freshness and then the, the Riesling uh, it's well I'm not sure what the one you have looks like what's the vintage on it Natasha she left. well anyway uh, tend to be pretty rich. The one I have here is a 2016 and it's still got a green cast to it. I don't, I don't know whether yours do or not. The reason I'm making a big deal out of this is as a wine uh, ages and oxidizes and uh, uh, gets older, the lower wavelengths, the blue and the indigo and the violet, get absorbed by the wine. And so the average color goes <clears throat> goes from this sort of straw, you know, yellow green to gold to, uh, and then it starts to get a little tawny, and then it starts to get a little brown, and if it's completely oxidized, the wine actually turns black, like coffee. And that's why. You know, coffee absorbs all the visible wavelengths, and so that's why coffee is black. Uh, and the reason I mention this is that if you get uh, 
if you're served one of these wines like a Pinot Grigio or a or a Sauvignon Blanc, uh, you should. Uh, it should never be uh, amber. It should never be tawny. And and if it is, if it's got a little brown to it, or even if it's golden, you should send it back. I think Florida is the worst place in the country for storing wine. Uh, they'll stick it out in a shed in the back and it'll submit it to 140 degrees and, you know, just cook the stuff so that you lose the fruitiness and the freshness. And uh, if, if you run across a wine like that in a, in a, in a wine bar or restaurant, uh, you know, make those people suffer. Let them know that you noticed. You know, just like you wouldn't accept soggy French fries, don't accept uh, ones that are that are brown and 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 uh, have lost their freshness. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Now let's let's. Uh, so we have rich and golden on the Chardonnay, and and I have the straw green uh, Riesling. Uh, Okay, now let's uh, let's smell them. Uh, the most important thing for a Pinot Grigio to be is 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 fresh, and you, you almost always smell peaches in Pinot Gris, and in this particular one, I get a, a citrus element, maybe maybe lime or something like that. And I get a little bit of green apple and some pear. So those can be the beginning of your laundry list for Pinot Grigio. And then in the mouth, you're gonna see, oh, I guess we're just gonna do all the aromas here. All right, so, so the Sauvignon Blanc has a very different kind of aroma Definitely, there's this high-pitched lime and some grapefruit, but it also has a funny kind of herbal side. Sauvignon Blanc means, uh, the Sauvignon means, means wild or savage. Uh, and so there's a, a kind of a, a bell pepper thing there that, uh, uh, it's an interesting compound. It's called former captopentanone. And when it's at low concentrations, it smells like grapefruit. And when it's stronger, it smells like uh, <coughs> cat piss. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm not kidding. The nicest thing you can say to a New Zealand winemaker is, gee, I got a lot of cat piss out of that wine. That's what they're shooting for. And it's the same compound. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. It just flips over. Um, sometimes you'll also get, you know, the, I, I, I didn't go through the, uh, what the, what the aromas were in the, in the standards. So may, maybe I should do that now because you're going to, they're going to show up in these wines. What did you guys think that the first aroma, the first coffee cup was? Strawberry. Very good. Yeah, strawberry. And uh, strawberry is a kind of high-pitched fruit. I kind of think you have strawberry and then sort of coming down, you get raspberry and then cranberry and then different kinds of cherry from maraschino to bing to black cherry and then plum, and then <coughs> blueberry, and cassis, and maybe a kai berry, and then finally like a Greek olive. And that's kind of my fruit spectrum there. So strawberry is very high there. And when we get to Malbec, you're going to see it's a red wine, but it, it always smells like strawberries. The second wine, uh, the second coffee cup. Banana. Banana, yeah. But banana, that's uh, amyl acetate. It's an ester. And, uh, uh, it's, it's common in very young, fresh wines. Uh, all right, how about the third one? Oh. Yeah. I, 
Yes. Very good. Now, clove is interesting. Uh, you guys aren't old enough to remember, but in the 60s, National Geographic magazine did a, it's when Scratch and Sniff first came out, and they did a two million person study, and one of the <coughs> compounds was eugenol, which is the smell of cloves, and they found out that one, one person in, uh, in seven, about 14% of the U.S. population cannot smell clove smell eugenol. Eugenol is also, it's that orange stuff, you know, when the, when you go to the dentist before she hits you with the Novocaine, they, they, they paint this orange stuff on your gums to numb them. And that's, that's eugenol. It's the same stuff. Eugenol comes into wine from barrels. All right. How about the fourth thing? I didn't hear it. Vanilla. Yeah, okay. Vanilla. Yeah. Now, vanilla, is, uh, people will kill their grandmother for vanilla. And so it's, it's very, it, it also comes from barrels. Uh, toasted barrels create vanilla. And, you know, I used to go crazy for vanilla in, in my red wines. And, in fact, I bought two cases of a, of a French Bordeaux called Clerc Milon, which is a Poyac owned by the Rothschilds. And I thought, I just thought that was the greatest wine in the world. I bought two cases. By the time I got to the 24th bottle, I could not stand that stuff. And the reason is that it was just nothing but vanilla. <laughs> and I just got tired of it. You know, I wanted to smell the wine underneath after a while. So, but anyway, vanilla uh, is very, very popular with, with uh, novice wine drinkers. And uh, so is the butter and Chardonnay. So if we, if we come to this next wine, uh, very different aroma and it's full of that coffee. Uh, well, I guess I should have said uh, the fifth aroma you may have recognized as coffee? Yes? Yes. Now there's a funny thing about coffee is that it, uh, when I used to drive from Oakland to San Francisco across the Bay Bridge, I would have this smell confront my nose and I always thought I've hit a skunk. Because there's something in coffee that's called a mere captain it smells exactly like a skunk, except when it's in coffee, we really like it. You know, I, I would just, you know, then I'd remember that the Hills Brothers Coffee Roasters was right at the anchorage of the Bay Bridge. So, uh, so we get confronted about halfway through with this, with this skunky smell that was actually really fresh roasted coffee. Uh, so what, what did you think the sixth one was? Here. <laughs> it's veggie yeah it's the compound is called uh, pyrazine and what we were actually using there was canned green bean to give it to you but you can also get it from bell pepper or, or take it chili uh, and that that uh, that's a common smell in the Sauvignons Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignons so you'll come across that so getting back uh, there's a style of California Chardonnay that's loaded with oak aromas like clove and coffee and vanilla, and also with butter, which comes from the malolactic fermentation. It's a bacterial secondary fermentation that converts malic acid into lactic acid, which is a softer acid, uh, and also creates this buttery aroma it's called diacetyl, and it's the stuff that uh, they put on popcorn at the movies. So, so when you go to a theater and you smell that buttery smell, that's diacetyl. It's the same stuff. And it's also the same bacteria that turns uh, milk into buttermilk. Now, in this particular wine, I, you know, I really don't like 
wines that are over oaked and, and, and overly buttery, some people just think they're great. Uh, and I used to think they were great, and then I just got tired of them. But anyway, this one, I think, has subtle oak and butter influences that are nicely balanced by some pineapple and ripe golden delicious apple fruit. Uh, and so I, I actually think this is really made well, well-made wine, and for sure, uh, for ten bucks, it's a it's a heck of a bargain. All right, so now we're getting over into Riesling, which is part of the Muscat family, and these wines are loaded with terpenes. Uh, causes the wine to smell like jasmine and uh, very fruity. Don't you think that's a gorgeous nose? <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a, a couple of flowers in there, jasmine and rose, uh, but also a, a almost cherry-like aroma. That I'm calling it lychee nut. You know, that reminds me, uh, you guys have a local winery called Schnebly down in Homestead. They make a lychee nut wine. Uh, I think Peter Schnebly is a really cool guy, and I encourage you to take a field trip down there and, uh, and visit your local winery. He has a lot of fun. All right, so shall we taste these things? Now, the first thing you're going to see in the Pinot Grigio, uh, you'll see that that those peaches and stuff, but it has a, a little bit of tannin. It reminds me of the, you know, the red part of a peach has a little bit of astringency to it. It's not enough to bother anybody, but it just kind of, see how it kind of makes the, your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth a little bit? And uh, what that means is that if you wanted to have a steak, but it's like 100 degrees out, you might want something a little lighter. And so what we have here is a, is a very versatile food wine. You can really pretty much have this with anything. Um, now, 25 years ago, nobody had ever heard of Pinot Grigio. And it, uh, it came into prominence uh, at the reaction to these big buttery Chardonnays. And so uh, they started something called the ABC Club, and that stands for anything but Chardonnay. So uh, at the time, the the alternative was Sauvignon Blanc, but as you'll see when we taste it, Sauvignon Blanc is quite acidic and, and it has this, this grassy or vegetal side to it. And so that really wasn't what people wanted. They wanted something a little more, you know, clean and light and fruity uh, without malolactic and without barrel and all that. And so they, they Pinot Grigio kind of came out of nowhere and now it's one of the most popular wine styles. So now when you, when you put your Sauvignon Blanc in your mouth, you're gonna see it's gonna make you pucker. It's, it's uh, pretty high in acidity. Um, and maybe a little bit of an acquired taste. But what it's good for is, is seafood. You go down to, uh, you know, get yourself some stone crabs with, or, or lobster tail and drawn butter or scallops or uh, oysters. And, uh, you know, those are very heavy dishes. And so this is what you use to uh, cleanse the palate. 
And that high acidity, uh, you know, your, your mouth wants to neutralize that acidity. And so what it does, it dumps a lot of uh, saliva into your mouth, which will cleanse the palate. And that's, that's how this thing functions. All right. Now we go to the Chardonnay, and it's kind of the opposite. It's, it, it's gone through malolactic, so the acid is reduced, and it's very creamy, and there's a little butter and a little vanilla. Very rich and soft. And uh, these wines are a little more difficult to pair with food but there is a formula. You want something grilled. It can be a steak. It can be fish. Uh, you want it to be lean so that the, you don't want a fatty dish because that'll fight the, the fattiness of the wine. Uh, you want it to be low in salt because uh, Chardonnays tend to be a little higher in alcohol and the, and the salt makes the wine taste hot. And then a little touch of sweetness, a little bit of mango chutney or uh, uh, raspberry vinaigrette or balsamic or something like that, a little touch of sweetness. And that, that'll be a seamless match with these big fat mamas. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, I think you know, m most of the time, Chardonnays that are this good are twice that price, you know, $20 and up. I think you're, you're really getting your money's worth here at $10. So then, um, Rieslings tend to have high acidity too, but they're a little sweet. And they're just loaded with fruity flavors, so a uh, little sugar, but not cloying because it's so well balanced by ample acidity. Just a uh, really delicious wine. And you know, this is a good wine. Uh, you know, even a beginning wine drinker they tend to fall in love with these German Rieslings. And, uh, you know, German wine labels are kind of hard to read, but wines are, are consistently good and they're all kind of the same style. So uh, you don't have to worry too much. Just about any, any wine from the Mosul will be like this and won't disappoint. Any any questions about white wine before we move on? Okie dokie. So now we're going to do a couple of rosés. It used to be that rosé was all sweet in the, in the United States anyway. But uh, recently, people have figured out that the French drink a lot of dry rosé. So, you know, if you go into the Winn-Dixie or the or Publix, yeah, yeah, you gotta dump everything. Um, <coughs> You know that aisle in, uh, in the Winn-Dixie that's got all the breakfast cereals on it? Yes. You know, you got you know, hundreds of different kinds of, you know, Cocoa Puffs and, and Lucky Stars and Captain Crunch and all that stuff. If you go to France, you go into one of their supermarkets, they're going to have a box of grape nuts for you, and that's about it. Instead, that aisle is nothing but hundreds of dry rosés. 
French drink more dry rosé than white wine for the British. And they drink it all year round, and they sometimes like it to be aged a little bit. Uh, so this Whispering Angel is from uh, Côte de Provence, which is near Marseille, South France. Uh, and it's a pretty typical example. And uh, the reason the French drink so much of this stuff, well, first of all, it's really cheap, but it also is considered to be the most versatile wine. So it, you don't have to worry that somebody's going to say, oh, well, that, that wine doesn't go with this food you're, you're eating. So it's, it's the most versatile wine. You can pretty much pair it with anything. I want you to notice that the color is not exactly pink. <coughs> the, the Behringer White Zin is quite pink. Uh, they're very different colors. The reason is that authentic rosés have this hue, it's sometimes called coppery or salmon hue or uh, uh, sometimes onion skin. So it's a little bit on the orange side. And that's, that's typical. It doesn't mean that the wine is oxidizing. It's just what real rosé looks like. <laughs> Get over it. In the, in the Behringer, what they actually do with white Zinfandel is they use activated charcoal to strip out all that color. And then they put some red wine in, and that's how it gets to be pink. Uh, so it's kind of a manufactured wine. Serious dry rosé has this salmon hue. Uh, and then I get, I'm, I'm often looking for what kind of flower is there, uh, what kind of floral character. Uh, you know, we've talked about uh, jasmine and the muscats and roses. And sometimes I'll look for violets, particularly in some of the reds. In this case, I think it's lilac. And then there's a fruity component that I'm going to call cherry. Uh, I don't know, does anybody have anything to add in terms of what they get out of the aroma here? Okay, so then let's put it in the mouth. You can see it's dry. Um, I'm sorry? Why wouldn't this be, why wouldn't this one be considered dry? I mean, not dry, but um, grassy. Yeah, grassy. <laughs> oh, you think it's a little grassy? Okay. Yeah, uh, in that area of Provence, they have a lot of dry herbs uh, that are in the air. And uh, those, that aroma, uh, the French call it garrigue, and it's a combination of thyme and, and uh, bay leaf and uh, rosemary and, you know, a bunch of these droughty herbs that come together to to make this garrigue, and it's in the air. <clears throat> so grapes have a wax cuticle on them, and that stuff dissolves into the, in, you know, into the wax. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a typical character of the south of France, is that I, I wouldn't call it vegetal. I think of it as, as, as a little herbal, particularly, uh, I sure smell uh, thyme in, in this, or white pepper. So then, that same white tannin that we saw in the 
Biagio is in this wine too. And I find the firmness in the finish, I, I think of it as kind of like chewing on watermelon rind. It's not something, uh, it's not something that you see in white wines. That's why it really works pretty good, you know, if it's really high out. You might want to choose this as a, as a one even for, for, you know, steak fajitas or something like that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, great substitute for red wine in hot weather. <clears throat> All right, so now we go, I, I, I kind of divide the world into serious rosé and silly rosé. <laughs> and so uh, this was a serious rosé. And the Behringer White's in is a silly rosé. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, but it is kind of a, you know, Pepsi Cola kind of wine. Yeah. Have this dark pink, as I said, that comes from putting red wine in for color. And then, whenever I smell white Zinfandel, I always get strawberry and a little bit of tomato. Oh, tomato. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah, I like them a lot better when they have more strawberry and less tomato. <laughs> but that, don't you see how that kind of smells like Campbell's soup? <laughs> um, and then of course, it's, it's somewhat sweet, probably about 3% sugar. And very simple, uh, but there's nothing wrong with the balance in this wine, and you know, it's, it's not going to change your life, but it's pretty drinkable. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now. I, Rosé has serious ones and silly ones. This is true for sparkling wine. I've gone through the method champenoise <coughs> process for you. One we've got here, we would love to pour you champagne, but we just can't afford it. So, uh, so this one is from Alsace, which is right across the river from the Mosul. Uh, it's in France, uh, and this is just a method champenoise brute. We we could have done the same thing with. Uh, there's some other bargain champagne substitutes. Uh, one of them is a Spanish cava. Yes. There are several of those that are just over ten bucks that are that are really good, uh, and also there's some uh, some American wines that are pretty good. And I think the the best deal, Corbel Champagne. <laughs> so here again like I was showing you before uh, you have you have very fine bubbles and that's a, a product of the method champenoise process <laughs> The color has a little bit of that, that uh, gray that we saw in the Pinot Grigio, and, th and that's because uh, two-thirds is from red grapes. It's from Pinot Noir. But they pick it uh, low in ripeness, and, uh, and, and they press it right away. And so you just get a tiny little bit of, of a gray cast of this. Oh, 
Now in the nose here, I'm getting a couple of things. I'm getting some strawberries, and that's from the Pinot Noir. There's also a, a subtle kind of citrus and even uh, apple aroma. And that's coming from the Chardonnay, which is one third of the wine. Uh, it also smells a little bit like like bread dough. And, and that's coming from the breakdown of the yeast. So it was sitting on, on the yeast for a year or so. And that gives you this yeasty nose. It's very characteristic of the of champagne. Uh, you put it in your mouth and it's I think it has an unexpected richness to it that's coming from the yeast. Quite dry uh, and uh, full of rich but subtle flavors. It's not fruity. Uh, so that that's serious sparkling wine. And now now let's get uh, some funny stuff. Uh, north. Western Italy, uh, up above the town of Milan, uh, is an area called Piedmont. So it's the foothills of the Alps. And, uh, and it, uh, they grow uh, some really great red wines there, but they also make a bulk process uh, sparkling wine from Moscato. They call it, Spumanti means sparkling, so <clears throat> it's near the town of Asti, and so they call it Asti Spumante. Uh, the one that we're tasting here, this is, uh, this is Balatore Gran Spumante. Uh, and so they, they don't ferment it in the bottle, they ferment it in a great big tank. It's called the Charmat process. And so they don't want that yeasty character. They just want the fruitiness of the wine. So where do you suppose Valatore Gran Spumante is made? Yeah, it's made in Modesto, California by Gallo. <laughs> and they're obviously trying to pretend that it's Italian. But you know what? I think this wine is really good. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, very dependable wine. I've been drinking it for 30 years, and it's old metals everywhere. And it's a lot cheaper than the Italian stuff. So highly recommend it. Now you can see it foams up like crazy. It's it's not going to have that fine bubble that we saw in the champagne process. The bubbles here are going to be sort of coarse, and you get it out of the way when you try to pull that cork because it's going to gush. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to incorporate, and so they're they're you know the bubbles are much larger. <laughs> is how it goes. Uh, on the other hand, just a lovely jasmine Moscato aroma. And it's a bit sweet. And uh, so, so and you have this persistent flowery aftertaste. How what would you what would you do with this wine? <laughs> what would you do with this second wine? Yeah. Can you pair it with? Yeah, yeah, but not. I mean, you wouldn't want to serve it with a chocolate decadence, right? You don't want something heavy. I'm I'm recommending strawberry shortcake. Ooh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? In fact, people have been known to float a strawberry in this stuff. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, you could do light puff paste, like a Napoleon or something like that. And, you know, it's also been sometimes used to just kind of get the party going. <laughs> okay. You know, as an aperitif, you know. Okay, so dump all those, and we'll get the reds going. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about tannin, uh, because red wines are all about tannin. We're going to look at a, a lot of different tannic profiles here, so you want to have a language for tannin. Uh, we're going we're gonna to basically taste from, from lightest to heaviest tannin, um, and we're talking about uh, another word. Another word for this sensation is 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 astringency. Uh, so sort of a roughness is like turning the inside of your mouth into sandpaper. Uh, we saw a little bit of tannin in the uh, Grigio, the first wine, and in the dry rosé. Amp it up now. Uh, often beginning wine tasters really hate tannin. Uh, you know, tannin, what I'm talking about is a texture. Not, it's not the same as bitterness. Uh, tannins can be bitter, but wines can be bitter without having tannin. Uh, bitterness is a taste, and tannin uh, or astringency is, is, a, is a touch sensation. And, and what's going on is the wines, the uh, tannins are combining with the protein in your saliva. So that's why you want your red wines to be very low in acidity so that you don't salivate as much uh, because the salivation causes uh, a coarser ast astringency. <clears throat> At the time, we're talking about the uh, kind of the size of the particle. It's just, I, I actually use sandpaper at different uh, coarsenesses. Uh, you know, you have emery cloth where it's just very, very fine tannin, and then you can go up to, to larger and larger grades where the, the size of the sand on the paper is increasing. Uh, and the other thing to think about is how deep is the tannin. Uh, the last line we'll come up with here has a real plushness to it, like like velvet or or the uh, 
You know, I sometimes talk about the kind of carpet that an expensive lawyer has. That's what I mean by plushness. Okay, so the first one we're going to do, this is kind of fun. This guy is George DeBuff, and he is the king of Beaujolais Nouveau. Uh, Beaujolais is in the in southern Burgundy. The grape they grow is the Gamay grape. And what these guys do is to stack up the tank with uncrushed grape clusters and just seal it off come back in three weeks. So the fermentation is not a yeast fermentation. It's done by the enzymes in the grapes themselves. And the result is a wine that's very fruity and good for early release. So November 17th, every year, there's a Grand Cru, uh, I'm sorry, a Grand Am uh, Grand Prix uh, race to Paris. And all these uh, race cars, <coughs> they each have a different, they got a case of Beaujolais Nouveau from a different producer. And then they, they race to, uh, they race to Paris on November 17th. And then the whole idea is that this wine doesn't age very well. Are, are you guys like having your own class over there? Yes, Wellington. Oh my gosh, you do know. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah, you know. And then we don't talk about location. Can you hear me? Now we can. Now we can. <laughs> you guys are like having your own class over there. Okay, so did you hear anything I said about Beaujolais Nouveau? Yes. Okay, all right. So, um, the, what they say is that it doesn't age very well. Uh, I don't really believe that. The one we're tasting is a 2017, and I think it's just fine. But uh, anyway, you'll see that it's quite fruity. It has a fairly dark color. And it's very purple. Uh, so you got this fresh berry fruit. And then when you put it in your mouth, you're going to see that the tannin is not very well formed. We call that kind of tannin uh, brash or rustic. It's, you know, kind of, it's not, it's not very elegant tannin. This is a, this is one of the few red wines that you're that okay to chill and and uh, you know what it's for is is like picnic wine. You go outside with some fried chicken and you know whatever it is you do for a picnic. You drink this wine outside and you drink it cold. So, uh, like I said, that 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 uh, Grand Prix race is on November seventeenth. And I can guarantee you by November 19th, there'll be case stacks of Beaujolais, Nouveau Beaujolais, all over Miami. So that's how we celebrate the new vintage. All right, now if we go north to Northern Burgundy, the law requires that you make all of the red wines out of Pinot Noir. They don't taste fruity to me. They taste like vegetables. So if we look at this stuff, it has a very different appearance than the than the Gamay, doesn't it? It's, it's a little 
It's purple. It's a little lighter. Um, it has a kind of, you know, almost a tawny edge to it. It's just, it's, it's going from, uh, going from purple to sort of red or garnet. Uh, now I think you're gonna, you're gonna understand why Northern Burgundy is the most expensive real estate, uh, agricultural real estate in the world. Everybody loves a good Pinot Noir. And this is a really good one, considering the price. So here, I don't know what you get out of this, but I'm, I'm seeing primarily that there's a lot of cherries, maybe Bing cherry. And there's a lot of that clove and other Asian spices to it, sort of exotic. And then there's some vanilla and a little bit of coffee, a little bit of toast there. Just a much more complex nose because uh, it's been in a barrel for a year where the Beaujolais Nouveau, you know, they just bang it right out. <laughs> Never gets anywhere near a barrel. Uh, and then here, the tannins are much better behaved. So comes into the mouth with this rich, spicy fruit, relatively light body, and then it leaves you with these elegant silk tannins. <laughs> this is Mayomi. If, if any of you know uh, the Wagner's, the uh, Chymus Cabernet is one of the most famous Cabernets in California, <clears throat> in Napa Valley. Uh, and this is the same family makes this Pinot. And I think they do a terrific job for, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking, uh, how, how about a little duck with this? Maybe cherry sauce or a duck or orange or something like that. Yeah. Pretty yummy stuff. So those are the light. Now we're going to do a medium-bodied wine. This is a, this is a, the grape here is Malbec. Uh, Malbec is a minor grape in Bordeaux. Mostly Bordeaux is Cabernet Franc, uh, Merlot, and a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon. And then you have these really tiny amounts of Malbec and Petit, uh, Petit Verdot that, that get blended in. Uh, they took this grape to Argentina, and 85% of the wine made in Argentina is made from Malbec. So this is the national, the national grape, and the Argentinians drink a lot of Malbec. They recently come to the United States, they used to just drink it all. Uh, so now we're, we're, we've got something that's kind of a medium red. It's a little darker than the... Uh, and the Pinot. And, uh, and there you go. There's those uh, strawberries that I was telling you about. Uh, and also some, some, some chocolate aromas. See that? A little, and maybe even some coffee in there. But with Malbec, you're always going to get that strawberry fruitiness. I didn't even drink, I mean, I didn't even drink. I'm so Yeah, you can tell, right? <laughs> so the thing about Malbec is that it always has very fine tannin. You know, there, this has more tannin than the, than the Pinot, uh, but it has all this fruit, and the tannin is not heavy. It's, it's just very refined. It's always that way. So I'm, I'm saying that this is a semi-serious, very drinkable, versatile food wine. You could have this with chicken. You could have it with veal. Uh, you could even have it with a steak if you wanted to. <clears throat> the only thing I don't particularly like about this particular wine 
is when I swallow it, I get an aftertaste that's kind of like rancid butter. And, and that's, a, that's a microbial defect. It's called mousiness. So, you know, a little bit of a flavor of hamster cage in there, and, and that's, that's not good. All righty. So uh, you've got a different Cabernet Sauvignon than I do, and I don't know what you're going to make of it. I've got the La Postel here. Uh, yours is a, yours is also yours. Yours is an Argentinian wine. Uh, this one is from Chile. You're going to have to tell me what you're seeing. Uh, first thing to go looking for in Cabernet Sauvignon, some kind of fruit there. It might be black cherry or it might be, might be uh, uh, cassis, very common. <laughs> But you know, we're starting from a wine that is much more, much darker, and it's got some age on it. So it's it's going to be it's not going to be purple. It's going to be ruby. So do you, the other thing is, is this, this uh, vegetal characteristic, like bell pepper or something? Does anybody get that in the wine you have? Yes, like kind of yes. a spicy pepper flavor. Yeah, yeah, so you get this fruit character and this bell pepper, that's typical, not everybody likes it. Uh, and then the tan in here is going to be a whole lot more than any of the wines we've had before, and it'll be tend to be hard and angular, sort of like really dark chocolate. And uh, and the reason it's there uh, is that these wines age really well. So uh, we're drinking them much younger than we should. A good Cabernet will go ten or twenty years in a good cellar. But then there are also people who just love this angular, you know, dense tannin. So you're going to be having this with, with, with heavy food, steaks and roasts, cheese that actually softens the tannins. And, and these wines are intended to be aged for a long time. <laughs> okay, so let's let's take one more shot here. For those of you, the tan in here is a little too hard. Professor, I have a question. Yes. On on wine nine. I have like sediment in the glass. Is that so? Is that standard in that wine, or was it just how it was stored? It's 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 what happens. See, they they take uh, most wines are reds are aged in a barrel for at least a year, and a lot of that crap just precipitates out. Uh, Nouveau Beaujolais just gets slammed right into the bottle before it has a chance to drop its. It's, it's, it's stuff and it's supposed to be drunk young so they don't worry about that sediment there's nothing wrong with the sediment in fact it, it has a lot of flavor to it but uh, uh, yeah that's typical of Nouveau uh, you could say it's kind of past its sell-by date Professor, 
Uh, and, but, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon will drop a lot of sediment too. And then what you have to do <coughs> is, is decant. Yeah. So I've got a decanter here. Right here. And uh, there's two reasons to decant a wine. One is to give it some oxygen so it can breathe, especially a young Cabernet. You wouldn't have thrown a sediment, but you might want to even put it in a decanter and even shake it up to get some aeration and open it up a little bit. And the other reason is if it has a sediment. So it's kind of like uh, the yeast that we talked about in Champagne. If the wine were laying on its side, it would form along here, and then you take a flashlight and you put it or put your you know your cell phone down so that you have a flashlight shining up through the neck and you're looking at the neck while you decant it very slowly. You want to get all the wine out, no. uh, and then you stop as you see, see the sediment come up. <laughs> You know, we, we could have done that if we'd known it was a problem. We could have done that with the Nouveau Beaujolais, and then we, but then we wouldn't have had this nice conversation. Okay, let's keep moving here. So the last red is the Coupe Syrah from California Central Coast, and this is another great big rich wine, but it's not going to be as harsh and hard as the, as the Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, also, Syrah does not have a bell pepper characteristic, but it does have some unusual aromas to it. So here we have another dark wine. It's purple, even though it's three years old. And you get a, you're always looking for plums in, in Syrah. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. It's, that's an important central uh, element. And then you have all these complex, weird <coughs> characteristics uh, sort of in a supporting role. One that's very common is charred beef fat. You grill a steak, the aroma of that of that beef fat. Uh, I get a little bacon in this one. And, and, and other things that are hard to put your finger on, uh, maybe mustard. Yeah. Uh, all right, so then here the, you have the dense tannin, but it's plush. It's it's not as angular and hard as the cap. Yeah, I see. See, it almost has a fatness to it in the mouth. So that if you didn't have the capability to age it, that this is something you could drink now with a steak or a roast, it's a little softer. Okay, so dump those. We got three more wines to do. You all ready for a little dessert? Yes. You sure? It's <laughs> 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 okay, now I'm drinking a true sauterne, and you've got a uh, a similar kind of wine. Uh, sorry, yesterday we broke your bottle of sauterne. Work the similar stuff. So you're going to see that this wine is quite golden. <clears throat> uh, 
deep gold with even a little bit of an orange cast to it. That's because of the enzymes that are in the, this, this, this wine is made from moldy fruit. Mold called the, it's called the noble rot. Or, uh, the, the scientific term is botrytis. And it causes the grapes to shrink. It also imparts a whole bunch of really interesting honeysuckle, marmalade, uh, you know, the wine's almost like a liqueur. And it comes in with about twice as much sugar as a, a regular uh, grape. Uh, the other thing that you'll, you may notice is that when you swallow the wine, it has a little vinegar. Uh, and that's very important because it's so sweet that you won't be able to, to choke it down except that it has that little vinegar tang there that that's really helps the wine and the palate. Uh, and so just, just jam-packed with all these dried fruit flavors and honey and, and honeysuckle. What, what would you do with a wine like this? Any ideas? <laughs> well, see, this would work with some of those heavier desserts. I certainly recommend it with chocolate mousse. Uh, what the French do with this is they have it with foie gras. Oh, yes. And they have it with half shell oysters. And uh, the nice thing about a bottle of Sautern is that you can open it and then keep it in the fridge for a long time, for months, and it won't spoil. So uh, you can just have a little sip every once in a while. So this is, this is what the noble rot looks like in Sauterne. You can see that some of those berries have shrunk, and they'll go in and, and pick those individually by hand, and then they'll come back after the, others, after the other berries have gotten their botrytis. Pretty, pretty disgusting looking for such a wonderful wine, huh? All right, now the next wine we're going to do port. So by law, port has to be aged for, for at least 10 years. Are are you guys going to shut up and listen to me? Yeah. You know, I'm not pouring you 16 wines anymore. Sorry. You get too chatty. Sorry. We're listening. We're just the stuff. Okay. All right. We just got two more and we're running over time here. So I want to get this done. Okay. When you make port, you take uh, red grapes and you crush them and you start fermenting them. Uh, but when they get down to about nine or 10% sugar, you throw a bunch of brandy in to stop the fermentation. So you end up classically with about 19% about alcohol and 9% and sugar. And then you put them in a barrel, uh, by law, Tawny Port has to be in a barrel for at least 10 years. And so if it's less than 10 years, they call it Ruby Port, or you call it Tawny, and, and uh, you know, it starts to get sort of less purple and more brown. This wine 
is a baby Tawny. So it's exactly 10 years in the barrel. It's just starting to make the transition from a simple fruity wine into the kinds of development that you can get with a true Tawny port that's 20 or 30 years old. Um, so the, you just have the beginnings of uh, what we're looking for. I get plenty of plums and cassis dark fruit. Uh, and it's just beginning to get some of the rancio character uh, and some of the, you know, like toasted marshmallow and uh, marzipan and, and some wonderful things that can come out when these tawnies are, are aged for a long time. So then in the mouth, you know, it may have 19% alcohol, but the sugar balances it so well. So it's really pretty smooth, rich chocolatey finish. The classic accompaniments to this would be blue cheese, particularly Stilton or Roquefort, uh, walnuts, uh, chocolate, and, uh, and, and uh, cigars. All right, and then another fortified wine we have here. This one's, uh, the, the port was from Portugal, of course. And this is from Jerez in, uh, in uh, Spain, Sherry. So this is Harvey's Bristol Cream. And it's, uh, now all the white wines we've been talking about before, the modern, fresh, white wines, we wanted them to be uh, light and not oxidized, right? Well, here these guys go the other way. Uh, this is an older way of making wine where they intentionally oxidize the wine. They see it, they let it see oxygen, it's in a barrel for a long time, they heat it, and uh, so you end up with this wine that's quite brown. <coughs> But it has all these uh, all these delicious aromas. It's full of vanilla and toffee and and nuttiness and chocolate. Here you're you're really seeing some of those uh, rancid notes, which in this wine are actually kind of wonderful. Put it in the mouth, and it's pretty. Sweet but it has a nice balance to it and you have this nutty aftertaste and very complex. Uh, and you would have this uh, classically with nuts, dried fruits and cheeses as after dinner or you might just have just a little ounce of that at bedtime as a nightcap. Well, uh, why don't we go around the room and each of you uh, talk about what your favorite wine was and why. Okay, so um, my favorite wine was the, uh, let me see, the Whispering Angel. Uh -huh. It's a perfect mix between white and red. It's kind of dry, which I like. Um, I think, yeah, that's my favorite one. Uh-huh. Okay, cool. I, I like that stuff, too. I, I drink a lot of dry rosé. Yeah. To wine. My favorite. Yes. Yeah. Who's going to go next? Who's going to go next? We're going to Rose. Um, I love Miomi, and I also liked the um, cab that we drank. Miomi is like a classic, like, peanut, so it's like just like a really nice... Yeah. I don't know. It goes with everything. I drink it like pretty often. It's like a great price for the quality that you're getting. Um, and then I liked the cab because I've never really had anything with like that really pepper, like forward flavor. And I thought that it was like just like a very interesting and almost reminded me of like a blend kind of because it had those like different flavors that you don't usually just get from a cab. Yeah. Cabernet can be quite profound when yeah. it gets old. Yeah. I thought it was really good. Okay. Second row. Um, I like the Syrah just because I like something with a really 
really strong um, smell. Yeah, yeah, but also kind of feminine in the tannins. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, I like the Pinot Grigio because it was light, delicate, and you could drink, and you can drink it pretty much with anything. Uh huh. Uh, I like the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, it's my usual go to wine, uh, but this one had a nice um, grapefruit grassy taste. And I usually, Very fresh, yeah. I usually drink it with a little bit of ice in it when I'm outside. <laughs> I know that's bad. But <laughs> it's nice too. Um, and I like it because I like shrimp and seafood, so it pairs well with it. And oh, I did also like. The, oh, sorry, one second. The, 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 for the holidays. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Um, I, I personally like the Italian Pinot Grigio. Um, normally, it's weird. I don't really like Pinot Grigio, but I like this one. Um, it wasn't actually the dry. It seemed very like balanced, in my opinion. Um, and then it's very versatile, so I just appreciate that. You know, you can eat drinking. Okay. Hi, I like the California um, the Chardonnay. Um, I like oh my god, I like that. Oh, I like because it's like very low, like the acidity. So yeah, acidity. So like it really affects my stomach. So I really look out for that. But other than that, it's very creamy as well. Um, it goes good with as you said, like meat and fish, seafood, which is good. I like seafood a lot. But other than that, I do not really like the the new vegan Sauvignon Blanc. That one, the Sauvignon Blanc. I do not like it for some reason. Yeah, I think Sauvignon Blanc is a bit of an acquired taste. And, uh, you know that you're choosing the the Chardonnay. I do think it's a heck of a good Chardonnay for the money, uh, but it's low acid, you know. And uh, I think that it, it takes a while to get the to acquire the taste for for high acidity. Yeah, that's true. Sure. Like Better with food. I like the Cabernet just because that's what I usually go for, and I like this one. It wasn't as dry as I would like, but it was it was good. So that's more what I need for. Great. Um, I'll go. So I really like the uh, I really like the um the Grant Monte. It was really good. <laughs> um it was very flowery and yeah. sweet and I think like it would pair really well. I think it actually pairs better with desserts than the dessert ones. Because it's light, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like the the taste like lingered on after some time, which I personally really like. It lingered on. Uh huh. On That's because of the low alcohol. Right, and I also like the tangy pork. It just reminded me of like a rum kind of flavor. Like it would pair really well with like Jamaican rum cake. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. It tasted really nice. So I know. I actually did too. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Um, my favorite was the Pinot Grigio. I really like it because it was very like peachy. I like tasting all of all light flavors. Uh, I just feel like it's like a more my Yes. So isn't it isn't it great to taste these wines together and to see how many different opinions? there are in the room about what people like yeah 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 yes. 
you know, as a professional, you need to be able to understand all those points of view and kind of work with, work with your customer to figure out, you know, what might please them. And that goes way beyond your own personal preferences. Thank you all so very much for making it here. And I'll see you online. Thank you. 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 Thank you.